Welcome back to Lions, Giants, and Bears, Trusting God in Times of Fear. This is week five of our study. My name is Cassie Waits, and I'm so glad that you're part of our class today. In the shadow of COVID-19, we are being plagued by a second virus, a virus we call fear. And while some fear is healthy, all too often fear overwhelms us and overtakes us, crowding out the abundant joy that life in Christ offers. In this five-week series, we are reflecting on fear, how scripture speaks to our fears, and the powerful reassurances that God offers us. Last week, we took a look at existential fear, the fear of purposelessness, the fear that none of this matters, that it's all for nothing. And what we found when we read scripture is that scripture is uniquely positioned to help us face these fears because it is through scripture that we encounter the living God. And it is those encounters with God that seem to move us through our existential fears. This week, we turn our attention to the fear of the unknown. And this includes the fear of death, but more generally, this is a fear of any uncertainty that the future holds. It's a fear of not having control over our circumstances, not being able to predict what might come next. And this week, what we will see as we read scripture is that when we feel uncertain, God does not. When we feel lost, God already knows the map and the way. And so we are invited to lean into God's faithfulness and trust in God's provision. So grab your Bibles and let's get started. As we begin our time together, let's open with a word of prayer. Let us pray. God of all wisdom, we thank you for this day and for this chance to gather, to study your word and apply it to our lives. We pray that your spirit would move among us today, opening our hearts and minds to hear the message you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're like me, you have been feeling a fear of the unknown a lot lately. This virus has affected every part of our lives and really disrupted most of our schedules. So your summer plans may be on hold, your fall plans may still be up in the air. And if that's where you are, then you understand what it feels like to face this uncertainty. There are many days I feel like I'm driving down a mountain road in fog and I can only see two feet ahead. I have no idea where the road is going and I'm terrified at what might jump out at me. This is what it means to fear the unknown. Let's pause here and reflect on our own lives. When have you experienced a time of uncertainty? When have you struggled with the fear of the unknown? Fortunately, we are not the only people to face this fear of the unknown. We're not the only people to face uncertainty. Scripture is full of stories of people stepping out into the unknown. And as we read their stories, we begin to see how God is with us, even in the midst of our uncertainty. If we go all the way back to Genesis, we see that the story of humanity is a story of over and over again stepping out into uncertainty. Adam and Eve are pushed out of the garden. The people who build the Tower of Babel are forced to disperse across the face of the earth. In Genesis chapter 12, we've, we've just gotten a snippet of Abraham's, um, of Abraham's uh, genealogy. And then in Genesis chapter 12, without any other prologue, 
we read that the Lord appears to Abraham and says, go to the land that I will show you. Again, another person being called to step into uncertainty, to step into the unknown. And Abraham goes. And over time, we get to the book of Exodus. And here we read how the Hebrew people have been enslaved in Egypt. They've cried out to God for deliverance. And God has answered their cry in a, a person named Moses who leads them out of slavery. Where? Not directly into the promised land, but out into the wilderness, into the unknown. And it's in this barren wasteland where there's no food, there's no water, people are dying, that again, God shows up. And God leads them as a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. God provides for them and God cares for them. As the people are standing on the threshold to the promised land, they receive instruction from the Lord. And part of those instructions are how they are to continue their, uh, their communal religious life together when they enter the promised land. Now remember, they've been in the wilderness for quite a long time. At this point in the story, the wilderness is home. And the uncertainty, the unknown, is the promised land. And so we come to Deuteronomy chapter 26, which is in the middle of these instructions. And here in this chapter, we have the description of how someone is to sacrifice the first fruits of their crop um, to God. And we're going to read the ritual that is to happen. And I want you to understand that this is a call and response. This is a liturgy. The priest says one thing, the person bringing the sacrifice says something else. The priest says another thing, and the person bringing the sacrifice responds. What we're reading is a religious ritual. But I want you to pay attention to the, the last response that the person giving the sacrifice offers. It's, it's the longest portion of this passage. And what you'll find there is that it is a summary of the way that God has been present throughout history for the Hebrew people. So let's read this together. Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number. And there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Did you hear the summary? Scholars call this summary a creed, and it functions a lot like our Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. So every Sunday, uh, when, if you join worship, every Sunday, the, the pastor will say, uh, let us stand and say what we believe. What is it that we believe? 
I believe, and everyone joins in at that moment and recites, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. That is a creed. It's a summary of how God has been at work, not just in our lives today, but with humanity, with creation throughout time. And so this creed in Deuteronomy 26 is doing something similar. It's a summary. It's a story. And it's a reminder that this is who we are, this is who God is, and this is our relationship with God. So why does this matter? I think it matters because as the Hebrew people are stepping out into an uncertain place, into a new kind of life, stepping forward into the unknown, they have this creed that grounds them as they find new places to live, new ways of living, they can always come back to this creed to remember who they are and whose they are. And this creed, just as any creed, is a way of giving us a reminder, a, a touch point in the middle of uncertainty. It's a way of pushing back against that fear. Because when we remember our past and when we remember God's presence in it, we begin to have hope. We begin to strengthen our faith and our trust that God's presence will continue to be there for us, even in to the unknown. Think back over your life. Recall how God was present for you during a time of uncertainty. Of course, this feeling of uncertainty doesn't go away when the Hebrew people enter the Promised Land. We continue to see that life changes all around. Circumstances change. And every time they change, every time we find ourselves in a transition, we find ourselves in a moment of uncertainty. And we are at risk of this fear of the unknown taking hold. And so we move forward to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. We are just a few chapters before Jesus will be tried and crucified. And in this chapter, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's giving some, some last advice, some last words of encouragement to his disciples. And it's not clear that they recognize that these are last words, but that's what they are. So let's read together John chapter 14. We're going to read the encouragement that Jesus gives his disciples as they face the uncertainty to come following his death. John 14, 15 to 20, 25 and 26. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. If the creed in Deuteronomy is a summary of the history of how God was present with the Hebrew people, then here in John chapter 14, Jesus is giving his disciples something else to hang on to. He doesn't pass along a, a statement of faith. He doesn't pass along any kind of creed. Instead, he says, I will 
be going from you, but I will not leave you. I will entrust you to the Holy Spirit. I will send you this advocate. And the advocate will remind you of all the things you know. So here in this passage, in John 14, we have this promise that you will not be left abandoned or orphaned. And we also have this promise of a Holy Spirit that will indwell the disciples and that will remind them what they already know. Now, that is the function of a creed, to remind you what you already know. I love that one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to remind the disciples of what they already know, to remind them of the ways that God has been present with them throughout. Now, it's a double gift though, because not only does the Spirit remind them of God's presence, it is the presence of God dwelling in them and dwelling in us. And certainly, they needed this gift because Jesus will be crucified, he will resurrect, he will ascend, and then the disciples carry on the ministry. And it's not an easy road. They meet with resistance. They meet with persecution. They are asked to step out into the unknown in faith. And what do they hold on to in those moments of incredible uncertainty? They hold on to this promise. And we hold on to this promise too, that when we face times of uncertainty, when we step out into the unknown, we do not step out alone. God is with us. And we hold tight to that promise and that assurance. But sometimes it's hard to hold on to that. Sometimes our faith falters. And this is why I love that the Holy Spirit isn't just with us. The Holy Spirit is in conversation with our very souls, reminding us what we know. And in those times when uncertainty swirls around us, when we are clinging desperately, trying to find some safe ground, I am grateful for the long tradition of creeds, for the long tradition of people of faith looking back at the ways that God has been faithful throughout the years and calling that back to mind in those times of uncertainty. And so we can do the same today. So as our final activity of this series, I'm going to ask you to try something that might feel a little uncertain, a little unknown. And I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of homework. And here is the assignment. Write your own creed of how God has been faithful and memorize it.